7. The Kinsman Redeemer The covenant establishes a bond, a very strong and binding relationship which commands the totality of the covenanter's life and loyalty. One duty of the covenanter is to be an avenger or redeemer of blood, Goel Hadam. The avenger or redeemer is the next of kin. The family is a natural covenant, and the role of the redeemer is spelled out in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25. The key to the book of Ruth is the role of the kinsman redeemer. See Ruth chapter 3, verses 9 to 13, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 11, we read that Zimri killed the king and then slew all the house of Basha, including kinsmen and friends, so that no family avenger or covenanted friend be left to avenge his murder. The law requires an next of kin to avenge the murder of a man. It is a mistake to read this as primitivism. Just as the kinsman redeemer has a responsibility to care for his own, so he has a responsibility to execute justice. It is part and parcel of the same responsibility that Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. This law clearly means that we have the responsibility for the care of our families. This care includes justice. Where the law, as in Paul's day and our own, requires state courts to try and execute murderers, our responsibility then is to work to ensure that the crime, whether theft or murder, is prosecuted. In biblical law, the avenger was still under civil law. Numbers chapter 35, verses 6 to 34. For example, accidental deaths or manslaughter could not be avenged. Moreover, before the avenger did anything, there had to be a court trial which sentenced the murderer. Numbers chapter 35, verse 12. The avenger thus had to play a part in the prosecution. Numbers chapter 35, verse 24. In the history of the role of the avenger or kinsman redeemer in Israel, we find that the avenger could be a woman if no man were living. If no one survived the murdered person, the court appointed a redeemer. In other words, the prosecution of a murderer requires that the murdered man be represented in court. The Bible gives us examples of a father as redeemer. 2 Samuel chapter 13 Verses 31 to 38. A son. 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Brothers. Judges chapter 8, verses 4 to 21. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 22 following. And a king. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 29 to chapter 3, verse 34. These instances are not necessarily in conformity to law, and we are not told of any legal process preceding these cases, although in one or two cases this may have been possible. This briefly is the status and function of the Redeemer of Blood in family life. It provides us with the pattern for Redeemer of Blood in God's covenant. The obligations of a kinsman redeemer in the law give us these facts. 1. He must be next of kin to the one whom he redeems. 2. He must pay all accrued charges and satisfy every legal claim. 3. The redemption of an inheritance might require marriage. 4. He must avenge the wrongs his kinfolk have suffered. A kinsman redeemer must redeem a forfeited inheritance. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 24 to 28. A kinsman redeemer must ransom his kinsmen from bondage. Leviticus chapter 25, verses
verses 47 to 54. The kinsman redeemer must avenge the death of his kinsman. Numbers chapter 35, verses 12 and 19. The theological implications should be clear by now. In entering into covenant with man, God bound himself to a relationship with man, a law-grace relationship. He made himself man's covenant redeemer as well as judge. In the Incarnation, God the Son became very man of very man, as well as continuing as very God of very God. Thus, both parties to God's covenant with man are now represented in the one person of Jesus Christ. He is both the offended Lord of the covenant, the gracious King who, in grace and mercy, enters into covenant with man, and yet he is also the Son of Mary, and a member of the offending covenant partner, so that he is the judge, and also the judged, the kinsman redeemer, and the one in whose person all the elect members of God's covenant are to be redeemed. Jesus Christ is thus our next of kin, our Redeemer. As such, he pays off all the accrued charges, and he satisfies every legal claim by his perfect righteousness and atoning death. The outlaws become family members by his justifying work and grace. As the bridegroom, he takes as his bride the church, so that the unfruitful and faithless becomes a holy bride to the covenant man. We are ransomed from bondage, and we are avenged. The forfeited inheritance is in process of restoration. The world, created to be the kingdom of God, was to have been covenant man's realm. Because of the fall, covenant breakers have taken possession of the earth, rule the nations, and seek to govern without Christ and in contempt of him and his law. History now is the work of Christ in dispossessing his enemies from his realm. A great shaking of all nations is in process to accomplish this task. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 18 to 29. The book of Revelation gives us the judgments of dispossession pronounced from the throne of Christ against all the nations. Meanwhile, the covenant man, Jesus Christ, prepares his covenant people, the redeemed ones, for possession. They are called to victory. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 Because they are members now of God's covenant family, they are chastened, and even scourged to discipline them for dominion. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. The father subjects his sons to this chastening to make them true sons, and therefore heirs, to sanctify and prepare them for their work now and for their eternal inheritance. This chastening of the sons is contrasted to the consuming fire that the Lord is to all his enemies. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. Both the chastening and the consuming judgments have as their focus God and Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, God's holiness and righteousness. Because a covenant is a law treaty, and because God's covenant with man is an act of grace, the covenant in Christ is made more compelling in its power and fire than Sinai. Paul tells us that Sinai, after all, could be touched, but not Mount Zion, the new Sinai of judgment. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For the very throne of heaven is now the true mountain of the covenant. It is Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and an innumerable company of angels, the general assembly of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hebrews chapter 12, 
verses 22 to 24. Abel's blood cries out for vengeance. Genesis chapter 4, verses 10 following. But the blood of Jesus Christ witnesses to our redemption, to the death penalty on all sin, and to his perfect work as kinsman redeemer. All the Abel's of history cry out for the kinsman redeemer, and Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 tells us that Christ will, in due time, avenge them all. He is their kinsman-redeemer. 